all of me for all of you. All of me for all of you. You know, on the night, on the night that I got saved, I was in my bed. I was an eight-year-old boy, and I was all alone in my bed. And this is my prayer. This was my salvation prayer. It wasn't very theological. Uh, it wasn't very precise. But I knew that I knew that I knew that Jesus was real and that he was Lord. And my prayer was, God, it was just this, God, I want everything you have for me. I wonder, it's a dangerous prayer right there, but I wonder maybe if you'd like to join me in that prayer this evening. If it's in your heart, would you just lift up your face to heaven, lift up your hands. Would you just say that, God, I want everything you have for me. God, I want everything you have for me. I don't want to miss out, Lord, not on just, not even on the least little bit. I want everything you have for me, Lord. Come on, Paul said, I press forward to take hold of that for which Christ took hold of me. Come on, God, I want everything that you have for me. I want to fulfill, Lord, that purpose for which you called me. I want everything you have for me. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Now, would you give him praise one more time in this place? Come on, just love him right now. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. God bless you, everyone. Good evening. Welcome to Harvest Time Church. I'm glad you're here. Welcome to everyone that's here on live stream, uh, both from our Harvest Time family and our Greenwich Outpouring family. And I think we have some Aussies watching from halfway around the world. God bless you. Everybody wave to the folks from Australia. Let them know that we love our brother. <laughs> Where the Spirit has landed, he comes again. Where there's been a well that's been dug deep, it's easy to reopen a well. And uh, there's a well in this place. I understand there's an underground river, which has got to be prophetic. You don't even have to be prophetic to go, well, that's got to mean something, you know. <sighs> Tonight, I just want to share with you. Um, I've got a message that we might get to, or we might not. Is that okay? But... Um, the glory's just a thin veneer from us. There's just a thin veil between where we are and the amazing glory of the Lord. You know, Moses said to God, oh, I want to see your glory. <laughs> I want to see your glory. And God said, well, if you... I can't let you see the fullness of my glory because you can't see me and live. You would disintegrate. But, but he said, Moses, I tell you what. I'll put you in a cleft in the rock and I'm going to cover you with my hand and I'm going to go by and, and I'm going to let my glory pass in front of you and as the fullness of my glory passes, I'm going to remove my hand. And you will see the hind part. You will see the back of my glory. So Moses is in the rock. He's covered with the hand of God. I can't even imagine what that had to be like. And, and God passes by, removes his hand. Moses steps out and has a look because God says, you can see my hind part. You can see my history. You can see my footsteps. You can see where I have been. And so as Moses looks, he sees the glory. And in the glory, he sees the beginning of time. He sees God's history. And so Moses begins to write the book of Genesis in the beginning, God. Because he's seen something of the glory. But you know, Moses had to wait 2,000 years for the fullness of the glory on the Mount of Transfiguration. His prayer had to wait thousands of years because he wanted to see the fullness of the glory. But the fullness of the glory is, is reserved for us in the face of Jesus Christ. So we all, with unveiled face, behold him 
And I want to tell you, you're not far away. <laughs> if there's been an outpouring here, or since there's been an outpouring here, there's going to come again. It's 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 coming again. Because where the glory's landed, it's going to land again. It's just the way that it is. You know what? We're people who are so hungry for God. We long for his presence. We weep in worship. We have, oh God, days where we say, God, where are you? Oh God. Because he has sparked deep in the inmost part of us such a longing and such a hunger to be in his presence. He's put eternity in our hearts. Eternity is in our hearts, and that's the bit of us that longs for him. And yet we live on this crusty old earth with all its limitations, and we so want to break through into that, into that place, and we long to get there, but there's a frustration as we struggle to be people of the Spirit. <sighs> Yay. Oh, he's coming. He's come. And he's coming again. You know, I love, I love to be where the happening is. I travel the world. And you know what? Sometimes it's to preach. Sometimes it's just to go and see what God is doing in the glory. And if I'd heard of the Greenwich outpouring, I would have been here, man. Sitting up the back seat, sucking my thumb, just... Because I just go all over the world looking for revival. I'm a revival junkie. I'm a chaser. I'm a God chaser. That's the way it is. You know, and I'm going to stay that way. And uh, I think, well, God, if you're not doing it at my place, I'm just going to go, well, you're doing it. You know, and I'm the pastor, so they will follow me. <laughs> but I just love the the being at that coal face, we call it in Australia the coal face, you know, where the stuff's happening in, right in your face. And I love being there. Um, I, I love it when God shocks me. I love it when I get a shock from God, when something unexpected and unplanned suddenly happens and you're taken out of this realm and into another realm. And I feel that in the worship tonight, that could easily have happened. We could have ended up somewhere else. You know, I was worshipping on the floor of my office. We're kind of pretty, you know, uh, casual where I come from. And I was sitting on the floor of my office. And my son, who was uh, helping me in the ministry at that time, he came in and we were just sitting on the floor and we were praying. And as we were praying... I felt a wind come into the office and I checked and the window was closed and the door was closed but this wind got more and more intense and it started to swirl and suddenly and unexpectedly I was caught up in, in this wind and, and I was caught up in a vortex that was just swirling round and round and round and, and as I'm sitting on the floor of my office I feel myself going up up, 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 and I'm getting scared. <laughs> Whoo! You know, when we sing uh, about uh, the presence of the Lord and we sing, I'm not afraid, sometimes I say, oh, just a little bit, just a little bit. And, and I'm going up, and I realized I was in this cone shaped vortex of light, and I'm just whoosh. Whoosh, whoosh, going up and up. So, so real was it that I've got my hands out, kind of steadying myself and riding this vortex. Now, I know that in my body, I was on the floor of my office, but I'm going up, and I lost all awareness of the floor and my office and I'm just going up and up and up. And I thought, God, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hit my head. I'm going at a really fast rate. And this thing's getting narrower as it goes up. But when, we got, when I got to the top, I just pulled myself through a hole 
<laughs> in the top and I stood at the top of this vortex and I looked and, and as far as the eye could see was this, this awesome, awesome uh, green, beautiful green carpeted grass as far as the eye could see and there was no horizons. It was like, you know, time and space has horizons, but this place had no boundaries. And I'm, I'm just standing there and I thought, God, God. And, 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 and an angel came and stood next to me. And so being me, you know, you're who you are in eternity. You're who you are here. You're not going to become somebody else. You were created as an eternal being, and who you are is who you are. That may be good news. It may be bad news, but it's news. <laughs> and so I'm, I'm just like, so I made an announcement. I just said to this angel, I, I've come to see him. <laughs> what else do you say? And, and the angel just kind of cautioned me a little. And I said, that's him over there, isn't it? That's where he is. He's over there. Because I could see the light, the glory of the light. Shaka, masukumbrande. Phew. So I'm walking with the angel toward the light. And I'm getting faster as I'm going because I'm excited. But I got to a place where there was a veil. And I stood there and I looked at the veil. And it was like this veil went on for all eternity. And it was like the scripture in Isaiah 6 was coming to me. And the train of his robe filled the temple. And I'm just looking. And the more I looked at the robe that filled eternity, the more I realized I was just looking at a fold in the robe that filled eternity. Our God is big. He is a big, big God. And I'm just standing there and I'm looking. And then I realized that my arms were full. I'm standing looking at a veil with my arms full of firewood. And I'm like, what? And I couldn't resist stepping into the veil. And I stepped through into the veil into the most amazingly glorious place that I can never forget and I've been hungry for ever since. And as I stepped in there, I bumped into someone. And it was my son who was on the floor praying with me. And he said to me, Mum, what are you doing here? And I said, Son, I got here first. What are you doing here? And we just spent time in the glory together. And then I stepped out and I still had my arms full. And I heard the voice. I didn't see the Lord. I heard the voice and he said to me, What do you want? Well, now I'm needing to have a reason for being there. And with my arms still full, I said, I've come to ask about revival. <laughs> well, it's a good thing to ask about, don't you think? I've come to ask, you know, sometimes you're surprised at what you say, but it's actually what's in your heart. And in the presence of the Lord, what is in your heart that's hidden and covered over by so much trivia actually comes to the surface. <clears throat> Yay. And I, and I said, I, I've come for revival. And, and I've come to ask you about healing. 
Because we'd just been through an amazing move of God where people were healed in mega ways and people would come to church on stretches and we actually had couches in the church for the sick to come and lie on while they got healed. And people dying of cancer were just brought uh, right back to health in amazing ways. But at the same time, I was doing a lot of funerals. And so I'm saying, Lord, I, I've come to ask you about healing. I want a revival. I want healing. And I, I need money. <laughs> Whoa, which was true at the time. Whole other story there. And, and I heard the Lord say, you already have those things. You already have them. And how do you say to the Almighty, uh, no, I don't. <laughs> I don't think so. He said, you already have them. And I'm going, now you need to understand that in heaven, your thoughts become loud words. So whatever you think is clanging out there. And I'm thinking, not so, Lord. He said, you already have them. And he said, look in your arms. Look in your arms. And as I looked in my arms, the firewood that I was carrying had turned into solid gold when I'd stepped into the glory and I hadn't known. And now I'm carrying solid gold. He said, you already have it. Just look in your arms. And I'm like... Okay, I don't understand a thing about this. I don't even know what this means. And I'm thinking this while I'm standing there in the presence of a veil of glory. And I said, Lord, I don't really understand. And he said, you will. He said, you have to go back now. And I said, well, I don't know how to. Like I came up in a whirly gig thingy. <laughs> and I don't know how to go back. I might have to stay here. And the Lord said to me, you are already back. And there I was on the floor praying where I left. Now you may sit there and say, what was all that about? Because I've been asking the same thing. What was all that about? Well, there's been an unfolding revelation to me over the time from that day to this. It's been an unfolding revelation that I won't go into. My point in sharing this with you tonight is that, you know, we are just a thin veneer away from glory. We are just one step away from the most supernatural event. There is a place where you can stand and the Lord will cover you and then he will expose himself to you and you may take the rest of your life to work out what all that meant. And you know what? It's okay. It's where we're supposed to live. We don't seek experiences for the sake of experiences, but God gives them so we receive them. I want to share with you tonight that sometimes it is our mindset. It's the way we tick. It's our limitations that prevent us from stepping into places that God has prepared for us in the spirit. You know, and, and sometimes it, it's you know, sometimes in worship, we just need to lay on the floor and snot all over the carpet. We actually have a very snotty carpet at our place. <laughs> I just, I felt tonight, man, woohoo! this place is not far off a cracker. It's not far off a cracker. Do you have a cracker? No? Anyway. It's not far off the glory. I just, there is a place, church. 
You don't have to be spooky. You don't have to be religious. You don't have to be super spiritual. You don't have to pretend that you have something you haven't got. But you do have to be open to the ways of the Spirit and the potential that God can blow your brain right out of your head. So just, just know that he can. Know that he wants to. And don't worry about what you've missed out on. Just say from now on, I want to do that. I want to be where the action is. I want to move in the Holy Ghost. I want to understand the ways of the Spirit because I've seen some stuff and I cannot go back. People say to me, um, do you have plans for retirement? I'm like, what? What the heck is that? No. No, I have plans for refirement. I have no plans for retirement. Whew. See, there, Jesus has equipped us by his spirit to enter into places unknown to us, to do things and to be things that we look back on and we might say, did I fantasize that? Did, I, was, did that happen? And, and as you do these things, the spirit of the Lord becomes very powerful in you. See, Jesus made a very powerful statement. And he said this, your traditions do nullify the word of God. Your traditions nullify something more powerful that gets on us than the word of God. And that's our stinking thinking. That's our traditions. That's the way we've always done it. That's what we expect. That's what we can have. Ha! Ah, but there is a dynamic within us that has the capacity. Poof, shaka to carry such glory. And within us, there is also the capacity to override the glory. And so we walk on this planet as human beings, longing for something, not fully knowing whether we can actually touch it or not. <laughs> Traditions create a grid through which we view life and it locks us into an existing framework and thereby, it forms a paradigm that is at odds with the kingdom of God. And we want to get shifted. We want to shift. We want to shift. I want to give you a little bit of teaching tonight. Is that okay? We'll go back to the spirit. But I want to, because it might just, might just help you. Because in the Western world, we are so so set, without even realizing it, we are so set in a culture of unbelief and skepticism. And if I told you that story tonight and you sat there and you went, wow, I don't know about that. That's a bit over the top. You know what? It is over the top. It's better than being under the bottom. You know, is it, do, do you question its credibility? You probably and it's the questioning and it's the skepticism that we hold in our heart, which is really unbelief that stops us from entering in more and more to some stuff in God that he wants to do for us. A toxic culture of unbelief and skepticism is like carbon monoxide. You don't see it, you don't smell it, but you wake up dead, you know. It just kind of creeps up on you and you don't even know you got it. You think you're a Bible-believing person and I tell you what, the wackiest stuff happens in this Bible. When I read the times when God came down and the glory and the throne events and the prophets of old and what they saw, I just go, my God. Well, did he stop doing it? I don't think so. See, we in the Western world with our sophisticated, educated Western mindset can struggle with a supernatural dynamic of the kingdom of God. We, we struggle. We got all educated. Now, I, I think education's good. I've I'm, I'm got a reasonable education. Like I can read, you know, and do sums and things. What are you laughing at? So, so I'm all for education. 
And I'm a nurse, so I'm, I'm all for medicine. I'm, I'm grateful to the Lord for scientific discoveries. And I'm glad I live in the Western world and don't live in a cardboard box on a dump somewhere in India. I'm glad about these things. You know, so I'm grateful. It's not that I want to knock the Western world, but what I do want to say is, guys, we have to shift because the Bible was not written with a Western mindset. You know, it was, it was written to people who had expectations of the supernatural in their daily lives. Hey, we believe in the supernatural as long as it's not too out there. And we have to analyse analyze everything to make sure that we're not being sucked in. So we've got to analyse. And, and I call it the paralysis of analysis. Because the minute you start to try and, and analyse the supernatural, you're going to get to a point of being paralysed in believing what actually happened. Because you see that little experience that I shared with you a while ago, I wasn't going to share that with anyone for like years because I thought no one's going to believe that. Who's going to believe that? And now I think I couldn't give a rip whether you do or not. I had the experience from the hair. See? See, in the Western world we've been moulded by forces that, that, ha that are beyond our control. And, and we need to recognise where that comes from and deal with some of these issues. And we, we've got to remove the tattoos of limitation off our mind. We're branded with limitations, you know. Just major stuff. Hey, from the time we entered kindergarten, from the time we entered kindergarten, we learnt to colour inside the line. Then we find out that we have, you know, you can't, you can't colour a camel pink. Apparently there are no pink camels. So you have to conform and get that right. And the sky is not green. And so from the time you enter kindergarten, you start to conform to the norm. Well... <sighs> It's hard work for some of us to conform to the norm. And you know when you were in kindergarten, you got an extra star today because you sat still and didn't ask the same stupid question again. And you also coloured inside of the lines. Woohoo! Well, you know what? God can do a green sky if he wants he can do a pink camel. He's God. And he can show us things prophetically and, and creatures that he's got that we would just be stunned. <sighs> Slowly I learned that there were possibilities and impossibilities. That there was the logical and there was the illogical. And there was scientific fact and there was the spirit of stupid. And so I conformed to what was expected of me in my mindset. And I want to just dismantle that a little, not just the kindergarten stuff, but the fact of where it brings us, because the more steeped we are in education, me having qualified that education is not wrong, but the more steeped we are in it, often the more difficult it is for us to experience the spirit. Because it got flushed out of us when we conformed. And we were the stupid kid if we thought one and one might could make four, could be 11. You never know. Well, it's not, you stupid thing. But it could be. Well, no, it can't be. And so it goes on. I want you tonight, for just a little while, to turn to a part in the Bible that you have never had a message from before, ever. I will guarantee that. So I want you to turn with me to the blank page between the Old Testament and the New Testament, and I want to speak to you from there, because that's where our problem is in our brain. Did you find that place? If you've got an iPad, just whatever, 
This message is not for you. <laughs> On that page, there was a period of about 400 years prior to the birth of Christ. Now, this has got everything to do with what I'm telling you tonight. During that blank page, Greek philosophers emerged and became so significant that what they taught became accepted worldwide. And it became deeply ingrained in us and the Western world has followed the Greek philosophers from that day to this. You see, one of those great philosophers, his name was Socrates. And he taught that the mind reigned supreme and that everything should be the servant of the mind. That was what he taught. That's what he taught. And, and then Plato's teaching were that um, we should be very sceptical about anything to do with faith. And then when, when Aristotle came on the scene after these other two guys, he had this brilliant mind and he reinforced what his predecessors had said and he organised their material really well and so for a period of 400 years we were steeped in understanding that it was the mind that mattered, that science reigned supreme, that if it wasn't logical it wasn't doable and to have faith was stupid. <laughs> well that was on that page. Thank God you can turn the page. You know what I'm saying. These philosophers had revolutionised the world and onto this scene steps Jesus, the king, with a kingdom that was unknown to the Greeks of the day, with a kingdom that had come straight from heaven. And he begins to teach and demonstrates a love that is entirely illogical. Amen. And he begins to present himself as a king who would die because of the love that he has for the people. Totally unheard of. He speaks of faith instead of scepticism. And, and he says, if you say to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, you shall have what you say. Oh, that makes no sense to me. See? And, and he speaks of, of a presence. He speaks of principles of the kingdom instead of humanistic, secular philosophies. So on one hand, Jesus has got the Jews to deal with and all the religious claptrap that they were involved in. And then he's got the Gentiles with all the humanistic scepticism of the Greek philosophies. And Jesus comes and he cuts a path through there called the kingdom of God and you either fall one side or the other or follow, make up your mind because he's going to win. See? Hey. And so a great confrontation of kingdoms began to happen. But we were the Greeks. We were the Gentiles. And we have now already been steeped in it. Our tendency is to have in the church a little bit of Greek mindset and a little bit of the kingdom. And we think, therefore, we are wonderfully balanced. That's dumb. You can't have a bit of both. You know, you just can't. You can't just do church with your amazing natural talent. Sometimes you've got to fall on the floor and have a snot before the Lord. You know, let me, let me hasten. I'll come back to some, some examples. But let me hasten to Daniel chapter 2. 
I'm not going to talk on eschatology, and I'm sure your pastor will be really pleased about that. But Daniel chapter 2 is a major event in world history. I'm talking about history here today, not the future so much. But you know the story because you probably heard it in Sunday school. There was all, all the Jewish people were in exile in Babylon. And the king of Babylon, his name was King Nebuchadnezzar. And King Nebuchadnezzar reigned supreme. He was not a benevolent dictator. He was the king. And the king has a dream that God gave him. So he says to his wise men, I want you to interpret the dream. And they say, okay, what was the dream? He said, well, I don't know. That's your job. Find it out. How would you like a king like that? I don't remember the dream. It's your job to find out what my dream was and to interpret it. So he threatens now, because his wise men could not tell him the dream, he threatens to kill them all. Off with your head. Which is a good cure for dandruff, but it is very final. And so they're all scared. Enter... Daniel. Daniel comes on the scene. God gives Daniel an understanding of the dream. He tells him what the dream was, and I'm going to briefly tell you what the dream was, because in this, we are in this dream. Your mindset is in this dream. Where your mindset come from is in this dream. As God unfolded what was going to happen on the earth over the years to come. And this is what we wrestle with today. Daniel says, You looked, O king, and there before you stood a large statue, an enormous, dazzling statue, awesome in appearance, and the head of the statue was made of pure gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thigh of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of baked clay. While you were watching, a rock, yippee for the rock, a rock was cut, but not by human hands. It struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and bronze and silver and gold were broken to pieces at the same time and became like chaff on the threshing floor in the summer. And the wind swept them away without leaving a trace. But the rock that struck the statue became a huge mountain and filled the whole earth. Okay, just to remind you of the story. He says, King, O oh, King. You are the head of gold. Yippee, I'm the head of gold. I'm the banking, I'm the, I'm the economic system of the world. I'm the head of gold. And after the Babylonians, the scripture says, the dream said, that there would come another kingdom, a kingdom of silver, and it would have arms and chest of silver. So after the Babylonians came the Medes and the Persians. Okay, so let's get that out of the way. Now it's this next bit. It says, and after that, and after that, on the statue, it's belly and thigh of bronze. After the Medes and the Persians came the Greeks with their philosophies. And it was represented in the belly and thigh of bronze. And the Greeks were considered... Uh, it was the Bronze Age, and all their weaponry and everything was in bronze. And so the Greeks were represented in the belly and thigh of the statue, and the belly and the thighs represent the reproductive organs, and the Greek philosophy that arose on that blank page has been reproduced throughout the world from that day to this. And you got sucked into it. And I got sucked into it, and I didn't know, because of the sophistication of the Greek society, I could give you some uh, staggering things about this, but it doesn't matter so much tonight, just to give you the essence to say that, that the, the dream that the king saw, the dream that the king saw was about what was coming, and that that belly and thigh happened on the blank page. 
the third kingdom of bronze will rule over the whole earth. Daniel says in his interpretation. It is going to infiltrate. It is going to be reproduced throughout the whole of the earth. And let me tell you, it surely has. It's been reproduced throughout the whole earth. So much so that if you want to get anywhere in life, you better have a good education. And you better have a piece of paper to prove that you've got a good education. It doesn't matter if you haven't got a brain in your head, but you've got a piece of paper, you're doing all right. Because the Greeks seek after knowledge. And we seek after knowledge. And we seek after head knowledge. Logical, scientific fact takes precedence over faith and stuff that we cannot explain logically. And we got it. I've got nothing against the Greeks, by the way. So if you're Greek here, be at peace, you know. Just be at peace. <sighs> This stuff got into us thousands of years ago and we valued it. In our nation, we valued it so much Australia didn't have an identity of its own and it modelled itself on Greece. Australia is the most sceptical nation in the world. We get points for being sceptical, you know, uh, and, and we are, for our numbers, the greatest sporting nation in the world. We've taken all that from Greece where the Olympics began because we wanted to identify with Greece. And so we imbibed all their philosophies and our nation is full of unbelief and scepticism. It's a very powerful thing. So when I tell you some of the things that happen on the mission field, and how the dead were raised, and how people walked on the water, you've got a grid, you have a Greek grid. And so at the end of what I'm saying to you, you have an opinion as to whether or not that could have happened. And so you look at the old Misho and go, yeah, whatever. See. But I, I want you to know that this stuff is not just reserved for the mission field. It's not. It's not just reserved for the mission field. It's for us. It's for us. That whole philosophy that we've been steeped in and that happened thousands of years ago has caught us. Zechariah chapter 9 verse 13. Or is it 13 9? I've got it written down. Zechariah 9, 9 11 to 13 says, I will rouse you sons of Zion against the sons of Greece, and I will make you like a warrior's sword. I am going to stir up the spirit man within you to do war against the sons of Greece, the intellect within you, and when the spirit man takes ascendancy over the mindsets and over unbelief and scepticism, then you will be like a warrior's sword. But there's, yeah. You know, I've been talking with your pastor and others and just sharing some of the things that happen in, on the mission field in Bougainville. And one of the things was about a little boy who had died. I'm not sure how old he was because they don't worry about age, you know. If you can put your arm, hand over your head and touch your ear, then you're five. That's just the proportions globally. So put your hand over your ear, you can touch the other ear, then you're five, you can start school. That's it. So I don't know how, this, how old this little guy was, but he had died. A lot of children die there from malaria and so forth. And his mother had him wrapped in leaves as is the custom. And she was sitting outside the front of the house with the little boy, obviously grieving. Now a truck is coming along the road full of people. And in the back of the truck, people are worshipping. And they sang me the song and I said to them, who wrote that song? And they said, 
Oh, we heard it in heaven. Okay. We heard the angels singing it, so we just sang it. So they're singing about, may our worship capture your heart, Lord, and your spirit lifting us up and take us to a holy place where we can commune with you. So they're on the back of this truck that's going along a rickety road, so it's going very, very slowly. It drives past the house outside of which is the dead body and the truck's going slow and the people on the back of the truck, because everyone's jammed in like sardines, singing as they go, May our worship capture your heart. So they're singing this. The dead kid gets up. The dead kid wrapped in leaves gets up. Come on. Come on. And walks after the truck. Now, I don't know about you, but I've tried raising the dead. I know it's not kosher and I know it's stupid. However, if you never have a go, you're never going to know. And so I've tried raising the dead, dear Jesus, and one of them, I thought he moved. And I took off. <laughs> the Lord said, you're a mighty woman of faith and power, paste and flour, something. But you know what? The thing is, we haven't got a mindset that can actually believe in the resurrection now. It's got, you know, we believe in a resurrection later on. We always believe in something later on. The religious mindset always says later. It's always later. Later on. We'll have revival later on. Later on, God will show. Later on. But Jesus says, I've saved the best wine till now. Now, 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 now. I've saved the good wine till now. So how are we going to know about raising the dead if we don't have a go? You know, I was... Uh, this lady, a friend of mine, passed away, and <laughs> um, the, the, the husband said, we're going to have a body viewing. Would you come and be with the family? I said, sure. Anyway, I thought, I'll just get there a bit early, eh? Because you've got to practice. <laughs> and so I went into where the body was in the, in the coffin, and... Uh, and I'm having a go. There's no books written on how to raise the dead. Have you noticed that? Because they wouldn't sell because nobody would believe that you could, so you'd be wasting your dough, you know. But I'm in there and I'm just, in the name of Jesus, get up, you know. So I'm, I'm doing my thing and I'd been persisting for a bit. And the funeral director came into the room. And I got sprung. And the funeral director looks at me and he goes, He just backed out and went away. On my way out of that room, I had to go past his desk. And he's got his head down, pretending not to see me like, you know, I'm the elephant in the room that can't be seen. And I went past his desk and I went over to him and I said, mate, today you get your money and you win. But a day is coming when we're going to get him back. Because of the spirit that raised Christ from the dead is within us. And we can't actually get our head around that because it's just not logical. And I know people are supposed to die. I know there's a time. I get it, you know. But hey, our Western mindset says it's just not going to work for you like that. And so we don't try. Now, I'm not suggesting you go and, and hijack the next funeral <laughs> or anything like that. But, but these are the things of the spirit. There's stuff. You know, there's stuff. Recently in Papua New Guinea, in this island of Bougainville, the, 
the, the guy there who led the revival, his name was Ezekiel. The revival had abated and they were just doing church. And one of his elders uh, got discouraged and went back to the cultural ways of witchcraft and left the church and he took with him a big proportion of the church and they all went back to the cultural ways of worshipping ancestral stuff. And uh, so he began to grow marijuana and fill his house with marijuana, which he would use to exchange for guns and, uh, you know, trade off and so forth. Well, Ezekiel got up in church one day. He was fed up with this. He stood up in church and he said, I decree that this is going to finish. And it's going to finish very quickly and very soon. Well, within a week, this guy whose name was Gehazi, whose name was Gehazi, the angel of the Lord came to his house and said to him, get your clothes and get out of the house. So he took his clothes and he went outside. And the angel of the Lord took his sword and touched each of the corners of the house. Now, you've got to understand, their houses are small, kind of more like sticks and grass than our elaborate houses. And the angel of the Lord just touched the corners of the house, stood back, and the house just instantly exploded, was burnt to a crisp, waste of marijuana, no doubt the neighbours would have got a good sniff that night. But the fire was so intense that it melted the axe head. And a fire of sticks and straw doesn't have that kind of heat. It was a supernatural fire. This man came back to Ezekiel crawling on all fours, repenting for what he had done, showing to him what had happened when the angel touched the house. And I said to Ezekiel, so did you put him back into leadership straight away? Because I'm into the politics of church, you know how it is. I said, so did you put him back into leadership straight away? And he said, oh, sure, absolutely, because he will never do that again. <laughs> he will never do that again. How do you respond when I tell you that story? It's a true story, verified by many people. There are angels that are sent to deliver us and to deliver our church. We have uh, over our, our... Can you put that picture up or is that impossible to do? The, it's on mine if mine's there. Oh, mine's not there? Okay, it doesn't matter. We had the council one day rang us. They had, the, the, the local government council had rung us because they said that there was something on the roof of our church building and could we please explain it? You see, the council had been out taking photographs of the area because the Buddhists had wanted to put in a, a temple right next to our church. And we'd complained and said, thanks, but no thanks, it's not going in. And we went and had communion on the land and claimed the land for Christ. Woo! But you know what? They, they went ahead and, and submitted their plans. And so the council sent out a photographer to take pictures all around that area. And having done so, unbeknownst to us, they had a picture. And they rang us and they said, can you please explain the phenomena on your roof? And I said, I don't know. So I went outside and I said, no, nah, nothing out here. <laughs> then they said, but we have a picture. We have a picture. And I said, well, send it to me. And in the picture, there is this massive angel. I mean, blind Freddy could see it. It's not like, oh, yeah, do you think? No, this is a, an amazing phenomena over the roof of the church. 
you know? And I'll bet there's a few hanging around here. See, we'd had a prophecy about three months previous that said God's sending an angel to the church and you will know when it has arrived. Well, we sure did. We got a piggy of it. (laughs) Got to be happy with that. You know what I'm saying? So what do you do with this? What do you do when you're with people who have walked on the water? I mean, that's only a Jesus trick, right? Wrong. He said, greater things than these will you do. And, and, and we're up there and I'm, I was writing my book, Sons of Thunder, and I was trying to get all the stories and then I'd hear their stories and then I would say their story back to them in their language and then I would go and I would check with the witnesses. And, and so these guys are telling us about a lot of people on their island were dying. And they went to prayer and the Holy Spirit showed them that there was witchcraft coming from another island. And, and so they were in prayer. They said that were young people, but up there, if you're under 50, you're included in the young people. And, and so they began to pray and the Spirit led them to the other island. Now, I'm trying to write it. So I said, okay, so, so you got in your canoes and you went across to the other island. And... They said, oh, no. I said, so you swam across. And they said, oh, no. Mipala, that is we, Mipala, he walk about, he go all the same on top long water. We walked on the water. And I'm like, okay. And then we got to the island and the spirit led us the Spirit led us to where the bones were buried that were being used in witchcraft to kill people on our island. The Lord showed us the place where it was and we put our hand into the ground. We did not dig. We put our hand into the ground and we pulled out the bag of bones which was being used in witchcraft against our people. And we walked back on top of the water, back to our island, and we destroyed the bones and threw them into the ocean. Now, I was sceptical. And I go, okay, okay, who saw this? Who saw this? Where are the witnesses? Who saw this? And the women that were standing around said, we all saw this. That's why the revival started, because we could not deny that that God in heaven was superior to the witchcraft on earth. We all saw it. What are you going to do with that with the Greek mindset? You think, well, that's got to be in these wacky, weird places. I get sick of it being in wacky, weird places. I want it here. I want to be at the coal face of this. I want to be where it is. You know, because that's our inheritance, people, and our Western mindset that happened thousands of years ago that, that has got us stuck. That's the, that's, oh, yeah, that's, it's a little bit kind of faint, but I suppose you got it off your phone, did you? Okay, if you reduce it, this is the angel that was over the roof and it's a bit hard to see there. Just a little bit hard to see, but you know, we looked at that thing with, to see it in color and to see it over the roof, it's like it's lights within lights within lights within lights within lights within lights. My answer to it at first was maybe there was a mosquito on the lens of the camera. And God said to me, well, what if there wasn't? And what if that prophetic word that you got this is actually the fulfillment of it? What are you going to do with that, Roy? And I go, I don't know, God. This is where we live. This is who we are. This is how we walk. We walk like this. You know... Psh. 
when we're in these places and there's a revival happening and we make a call for salvation or we make a call for missions or a call for devotion to the Lord or whatever call we call for, the people, there's often not many people sitting in the pews, which are just little bamboo slats. But somehow, all of a sudden, the place fills up with people. Because most of the people weren't sitting inside the little building. Most of them were outside on the grass or up in the trees or somewhere listening. And when we make a call, the people just come in waves. And they just cast themselves down before the Lord. They just dive. They, they just dive in. And they'll bang their heads. It's, not, it's a dirt floor. They'll just bang their heads on the dirt floor in desperation for the presence of God. I want this. And they bang their heads. And the next wave comes and lands on top of them. And then a third wave will come. So we don't have catchers. We have dragger offerers. We call them dragger offerers. Where's the dragger offerers? You've got, to get, you've got to drag them off the people underneath because they're going to smother. What we do with this kind of thinking, it's kind of in our sophistication. We can't get our head around it. I'm, going to, I'm not going to talk anymore because I've... Shaka. But there is a place. There is a place. And, and we can't allow... Our sophistication, our education, our scientific understanding, our logical mindset to talk us out of the ways of the spirit and the amazing places that we can go to and the things that we can see in the spirit because we've got some stinking thinking that we've hooked into and we've got a grid and we can't see past it. The next time you have an outpouring in this place, I believe you are going to see signs and wonders that you are going to go home and not even dare tell anybody that you saw and then when you do tell somebody, they will say, I saw the same thing. And each one being a little bit intimidated to share it because you're afraid that you're the nut. But you're not the nut because everybody saw it and everyone's frightened to say they saw it. Because God is lifting. He is lifting off us. He's lifting off us the limitations in our brain in order that when the fire comes, we don't just put our toe in and go, oh, yeah, I experienced that. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, I felt that. Yeah, yep. You know what, these people up there, I said to them, I want the fire like you got the fire. I want to have the fire of God. So these guys start praying for me. And they're dancing around and they're yelling out, Cook him, em, God, cook him, em. cook her, cook her, cook her, cook her, cook her, put her in the cooker and cook her with your fire. So it's not about putting a toe in anymore. God is coming with a flame of fire that's going to burn our Western mindset to a crispy. And you're not too old for it and you're not too young for it. The only thing that will disqualify you is a refusal to shift your mindset from the logical, acceptable ways that you have been taught and into a new place where it goes, whatever God, bring it on, I don't give a rat's. <laughs> whatever. God can speak to us in dreams and visions. Majorly. Speak in dreams and visions. Hey, Marashti. Elevish. Do you want it? Do you want it? You know what? I've got one more story. Am I okay, Pastor? One more story about this whole Western mindset thing. I went to Guatemala because there was a revival. Now, I thought if there's a revival, <coughs> I'm going to go. 
so I don't sell the kids or the grandkids. But I found the airfare somehow. And I went from Australia to Guatemala. That's a fair distance. And I just went to learn about revival. I went to watch it and to learn. And when I got there, I was met at the airport by one of the pastors of a church who picked me up and took me to where I was going to stay. And on the way in the car, he gave me a manila folder full of an itinerary that I was supposed to do while I was in Guatemala. And I'm thinking, he's picked up the wrong chick from the airport. (laughs) He's picked me up by accident. And look, there's somebody back there who's the revivalist that he should have got. So... I said to him, sir, I think there's been a mistake. He said, didn't you come for the revival? I said, yes. I came to learn. I didn't come to do anything. I just came to learn. And he looked at me and he said, so how are you going to learn if you don't do it? Well, there's a thought. How are you going to learn if you don't do it? Oh, I thought you sat at a desk and took notes. Passed an exam. Well, I want to tell you that night I thought, oh, I've got all this, I've got this itinerary and it's revival, and I'm not a revivalist, and what am I going to do? So I got up early the next morning, I get down on my knees and I'm worshiping the Lord. And I've got the headphones on and I'm worshiping away. And I start to choke. And I think I'm having a heart attack, and I'm just choking and coughing and spluttering and I'm getting choked. And, and with the last kind of bit that was left in me, I heard myself yell out, spirit of unbelief and scepticism, get out of me, get off me. And the whole thing stopped. And I went, oh boy, that was good. Get back to worship. <laughs> and as I do, I look up across the room and I see this creature this is as true as I'm standing here I see this creature dangling between the ceiling and the floor but not touching either and it was the ugliest looking thing I ever saw and I'm looking at it and I said you by now I'm standing up walking to the wall Nobody else in the house is aware of what's going on. And I'm saying, you are the ugliest thing. You are ugly, 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 ugly. Do you know how ugly you are? And the Lord said to me, that's what unbelief looks like to me. That's what skepticism and cynicism looks like to me and I'm like okay and it stayed there and when something stays you know God's not finished yet right so I'm standing there and I'm saying God it's it's got a big head and the Lord spoke to me from the scriptures over every aspect of this creature. And I said, Lord, it's got such a big head. And he said, Knowledge puffeth upeth. I said, Lord, it's got no neck. And he, and he talked about repenting, you stiff necked and uncircumcised of heart. And I'm like, Lord, I'm a pastor. I'm not uncircumcised of heart. But the Lord's speaking to me. And this creature, this thing, had long gangly arms coming out of its head somehow and they were just all the way almost to the floor, like dangling there, looked like somebody in depression. And the Lord said, lift up those hands that hang down because a lot of depression comes out of unbelief. And I'm like, okay, okay. I said, Lord, it's, it's, it's got no trunk. Like, it's gutless. I, I, you know, we, we use that in Australia. I know it's okay here, but it, it's got no trunk. It's got no gut. It's got no... And the Lord started to speak about, to me about the cowardice of unbelief. 
gutless wonder. I wrote a book about this. It's out there if you want it. And I'm just looking at it. And then I saw the legs that looked like a pair of lady stockings hanging on the line. And I said, Lord, these legs are really weak looking. And the Lord started speaking to me about feeble knees. Lift up those hands that hang down. Strengthen those feeble knees. And be not faithless and, and unbelieving. Then I had had this major encounter with something that threatened to throttle me and, and here it was right there. And as the Spirit of the Lord started to speak to me about the symptoms, if you will, of unbelief, I recognised each one of them in my heart. And as he finished speaking to me, that creature just disappeared through the wall and was gone. It was My friend was in the next room. I don't know how she got on, but <laughs> I didn't ask. And I said... To the guy who was the leader over all those churches, the next day I plucked up the courage to tell him. And to me, this was really serious matter. And he just laughed at me. He just laughed. And he said, well, you're an Australian. And you come into a place of faith and revival and everything that, that you're thinking gets exposed in the light of a culture of faith. I'm like, okay, thanks for telling me. And then the Lord spoke to me and said, it's all over your nation. It's all over. It's, it's the ruling spirit over the Australian nation is the spirit of unbelief. And it's over the whole of the Western world. And that's why it's so hard to do miracles because of the unbelief. And that's why we struggle because we want to be sophisticated. We want to be educated. We want to be logical. But the Spirit of the Lord is humble. And he wants us to just follow his ways. Thank God for your education. But don't let that ever stop you. You're not going to need it through all eternity. Shaka. Shaka Bahasi. Mariande Livishti. Nibo Barande Nimosakabahasite. Sto Kutande Namasi. Just praying in tongues is illogical. My mind tells me, oh, for crying out loud. And I have to say to my mind, shut up or I'm going to keep on doing it. Shakabasi. Sakabahasi. Church, you guys are going to come into something really big. I, I, I'm not just sucking up to you or the pastor. I wouldn't tell you if I didn't think it. I actually feel the spirit on me as I say it. There's something not far away that's going to break. And some of you might get offended. Your brain might get upset. Well, shift it now while you can. And understand that if God wants to do things that are unseen and unheard, he can do it and he can do it in your life. Let's all stand, shall we? <clears throat> well, I've kind of, I, I was told there was no time restriction tonight, so I've burbled on for quite a while. But I hope it's given you hope to know that, that there is a spirit dynamic. And it's for you. Put your hand on your belly button and say, it's for me. It's for me. It's always for the missionary and it's always for the person some, for some faraway country. No, it's for me. I want it. I want to be in the cleft of the rock. I want to stick my head out and see the glory of the Lord pass by. I want it. I want to see the dead raised. I want to heal the sick and raise the dead. I want to do it. I want to do the stuff. And you know what? We're going to do it. We're going to do it. So stop thinking you shouldn't try. Have a crack, Nigel. You'll never know your luck. Barushde. Hallelujah. I want to pray with people tonight. I don't even know what we want to pray for. Maybe we could just all get together and pray and see what happens. 
You know, maybe some of us actually need to re- repent. I had to repent when I saw this creature because I realized there was so much of it in my life. There was so much skepticism. The revival at our place, the the move of God at our place didn't last as long as I'd like it to have. It came and went and came and went. And I understand now it came and went according to my mindset. So if you want to come and let's just, maybe you need to repent to begin with. We'll go from there. Just say, Lord, I, 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 I repent over a spirit of unbelief. I repent over being skeptical and cynical. I want to just get rid of that. So why don't you come and we'll pray together and we'll repent together. Oh, shadabasi. Shokula masi katahati. Irande ne mo sande lebo kumba hasi. Ruha sata. Ruha sata. Ola mande. Ola mande. Shutu suha. Shutu suha. Korabuye. just take a moment and agree with me as I pray. I'm just going to pray a prayer of repentance. It's not on your behalf. It's for me. (laughs) I have to keep repenting. You know what? You just join with me as we ask the Lord to forgive us for our unbelief because it doesn't look good to Him. So Father, we come before you tonight thankful for the blood of the Lamb. And we repent tonight over skepticism of things that we read in your Word, over skepticism of things that we hear on the day-to-day basis, and we analyze them, and we throw them out because it doesn't suit our logic, and it doesn't suit our scientific understanding, and it doesn't make us look good in front of others. So, Lord, tonight we come to you and we repent and say, Lord, restore us in spirit. And I ask that the the, the Zion in us would arise and, and Lord, would, would, would overcome the Greek mindset in us and we would become like a warrior's sword and we would move from strength to strength. And when you come amongst us, Lord, it will be in a great power because you will have a nucleus of people that you can trust with the wacky stuff that you want to do. Spend a moment just repenting before the Lord. Just spend a moment. It doesn't take long to repent. We just acknowledge that there's been unbelief in us. That we've put the ways of the Spirit second that our pride and our sophistication has ruled us. So we just repent before God. And He comes with wonderful forgiveness. And He breaks off us. The anointing breaks the yoke. And He breaks off us. That which has held us back and locked us in caused a mindset Shakaba Sadava and Lord I just release now in the name of Jesus a fresh anointing of the spirit fresh anointing to believe a new expectation of what you're going to do not in some missionary somewhere but here among us Lord here among us Lord Lord, let us not be ashamed of the encounters that we have with you. Let us be bold and receive them. And Father, I pray that we shall see the dead raised to life again. And those things that we thought impossible shall be seen and done among us for your glory. 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 
for your glory. Kula Mande Shakaba Shakaba Shaka. Sir, I see you really hungry, eh? Uh, I, I see, I see like, I just see you just hanging out for a big hamburger in the spirit, like a big feed from God. I see that. And the Lord says, blessed are they, blessed <laughs> to be envied. Blessed are they who hunger and thirst, for they shall be filled. So Lord, I just bless this man in the hunger that he has tonight. And I ask that you would speak with him. I break off you any spirit of unbelief and I release you into a faith that you've never known before in the name of Jesus. Raboshe. Hey! Father, thank you. Father, thank you. Father, thank you. Hey!